were able to follow it. So the question is, why did the lion cross the canyon? And then how fast did she travel? And if you look here, we have readings at she started down um, and was down in the Hermit Basin area at one o'clock, and then at three o'clock crossed the river, was across the river by five, and was up halfway by seven, and then up to the higher elevation by nine in the evening. And that's pretty good. She didn't even take the trail and she had to cross the river. But pretty fascinating. And that's the only one that, um, that we had collar that we had found across the river like that or to cross the canyon. Most all of them that we have been tracking have stayed in the South Rim area, but also utilize all the way up here into Flagstaff. And there's actually uh, three different zones of um, lions that are then come and utilize the Grand Canyon area and spread out from there. Okay, Mexican spotted owl is another one that, that we're doing a lot of tracking on, and the, uh, this one is a threatened species. And so any kind of um, activity like fire or uh, overflights, if we're looking at moving overflights to a different area and they're used by Mexican spotted owl, then we uh, need to consult on that. So um, in the fire sense, we have to do a survey for two years to see if they're utilizing the area, and if not, then then fire can be reintroduced. Um, but these are mainly, they nest and reside down in the, um, in the cliff areas and then utilize the forest for feed and foraging. Bighorn sheep is another one, and you can see the purple dots on there following the river. We have a significant population and we're, we, we haven't stopped counting. So we don't even know the significance yet of, of the population, but um, it's pretty healthy, and uh, we do uh, trips every year to do counts on the river itself, just to, to call her and then follow the sheep. Okay, next management policy. Management of threatened or endangered plant species. So we'll survey for and protect and strive to recover all species native to the National Park System units. So the condors. This is one of the most celebrated success stories at Grand Canyon. Um, and uh, here you can see that we held the record or we held the, the first honor of having wild chicks hatched in Grand Canyon, the first ones to wild chicks to be hatched. But uh, I understand that in California they just had some wild chicks hatch, or chicks hatch in the wild, that's really what I want to say. Um, but here you can see this is a nest site and um, which is out um, by the Hermit area. We've also had several other um, areas. One is over by um, Topeats Creek, and then um, just off of Yaki Point, there was a, a nest site this last year. Um, and what's interesting is that in these caves that they, you can see in the middle lower picture there, you can see the egg back there, and uh, there's evidence of prehistoric um, skulls and that from condors in these caves. So they've come back and they're utilizing the same areas of their ancestors. So it's pretty, pretty significant. Uh, the population, I know some folks were saying that they were up the canyon yesterday. You can go any day and see just a whole gaggle of, of condors at the, at the canyon. Early morning is great along the rim and they just fly at eye level. And I'm uh, very curious. Uh, some of the dangers for them right now is still the lead issue, and then ingesting lead from carcasses that have been shot by lead bullets. Um, the Game and Fish has a, a voluntary program that uh, hunters can trade their lead bullets in for copper ones, or get a discount on copper bullets, which don't fragment like the lead does. Um, the other thing is just shiny objects. And, uh, over there on Mather Point, you know, people like to stand and throw the coins over their shoulder out onto a rock. And um, we actually had one condor that uh, was found dead and had a quarter lodged in its throat, so it died from not being able to eat. And so they're going to pick up shiny objects and that would happen to swallow them. So just some of the challenges for keeping the condor alive. Canab Amber Scale, how many of you have heard of the Canab Amber Scale? few, okay. Just a darling little snail here. Um, resides at uh, Basie's Paradise, but we have translocated uh, the a population of the 
the little guys over to um, Elves Chasm, in the upper Elves Chasm region, and they're doing very well there. Um, and now there's talk about, well, are they really truly um, a, a threatened species, and is this the, the one that resides here really related to the one in Canab, and so forth. But even so, we still manage them for their uniqueness. Um, during the high flow events, because they reside down near the water level, during the high flow events on the river, when the river comes up high, then we um, go in and move them into a protected area, and when the water drops, and bring them back down. So quite an effort to keep these guys going. And then some of the other species, the, the humpback chub, the leopard frog, and the willow flycatcher. And the significance of these is that the, the river environment is very critical to them. Um, the leopard frog, we do have a, um, a registration of seeing, finding one in the Kanab Creek area. They frequent the whole canyon at one time, and so we're hoping that just hoping that it's just more that we haven't found them and that they do exist in more places than just the Canal Creek area. Same thing with the willow flycatcher. There, right now, there's been a nest down in the Marble Canyon area, um, but it hasn't been occupied in the last couple of years. And then there is some areas down in the lower canyon. But the idea is, you know, the willows. They like the willows, but they, they're utilizing the tamaras, but we're not sure about the correlation of them not coming back to the canyon. It has to do with the tamaras and the lack of willow or what. So we're still trying to, to piece that together. And then the chubster is uh, another story, and I think you probably heard that the, they've been keeping track of the population of the Little Colorado River, and I know Steve Carruthers spent a lot of time at the Little Colorado County and Chubb, and, and back in the 80s, we saw about 15,000, something like that. And right now, the number has increased from um, a low of around 2,000, now up to, um, say, around 6,000, 6 to 7,000. Um, but the humpback chub is really dependent upon the natural, warm, flooded type of river, the sediment-laden river. Um, and so this has pushed it into the Little Colorado River, where it, um, that's where it breeds as well as has to survive until it can grow to a size to get out into the main current and then have to come up against the rainbow or brown trout, which are um, love to chomp on humpback chub. And then Mexican spotted owl, um, again another one of the, as I said, the cliff dwellers, and you can see uh, one of the areas in which they like to nest. And then over here on the right is a, the milk fetch. This is the sentry milk fetch, and you can see how small it is. And the picture above is not exactly where it resides, but it's where it likes to reside. And you can see the conflict in terms of trying to care for the milk fetch. So it likes that rocky area. It kind of lives in between the cracks of rocks. And, uh, and just a tiny little plant, and it's only found at Grand Canyon. Um, it's out at Maricopa Point area. Okay, wilderness. Um, and an interesting thing about wilderness, we have no designated wilderness in Grand Canyon. However, we have proposed wilderness. And we are responsible for managing that wilderness for, as wilderness, until Congress um, makes a decision on whether it will be definitely designated wilderness or not. And so the idea is it takes Congress a long time to designate wilderness. And so as we propose it and bring it forward, then we cannot take that opportunity away from, from, um, from Congress. So as a result, we have a whole management um, policy around managing it, and we utilize a method to make sure that we're consistent with the management requirements and that we minimize impacts. 1.1 million acres of Grand Canyon, of the 1.2 million acres of Grand Canyon, are proposed wilderness. Some of the monitoring that we look at, um, we, it involves collecting assessments of resource conditions, and that would be you know, the effects of humans. Um, quality of the visitor experience, opportunities for solitude, and then we consider the impacts of our own use, <coughs> creative use and, and activities. So even when, when we say we're going to go out and do something, then we have to go through an elaborate process of really assessing what is going to 